you've heard the scripture several times. This morning we are talking about that, that very potentially famous phrase of, come to me, ye who are weary, and I will give you rest. I remember a while ago, I was a youth director, and I would always, on Wednesday nights, you know, you sit with the youth, and I would be talking to them about, how was your day? How's your week? And inevitably, if you're a parent, you know the answers. It was like, oh, nothing, nothing happened. I didn't learn anything. Nothing's going on. Or they'd tell me about the thing they're really excited about. You know, I got this game coming up that I'm really looking forward to. Or I've got this hobby that I'm really excited about. Um, but then sometimes, very occasionally, as little as possible, I would find myself sitting at a table with adults, um, like the parents, senior adults, whoever, and people who weren't teenagers. And I knew I was always at that table because I would say, how was your week? And inevitably, I would hear, I'm busy. Inevitably, that would be the phrase, I'm busy. I wouldn't hear, oh, nothing, nothing's going on. Here's this thing I'm excited about. Always. It's like, it was like this, like, Part of being an adult is when you're an adult, you have to respond to that question by saying, I'm busy, and then you can move on with the rest of the things. And I know that because I have found myself, now that I am getting older, starting to say, oh, I'm just busy. Here's all the things that I've done lately. I knew I was at an adult table because it's like they had to prove how busy they were, and they were like one-upping each other with busyness. You know, it's like, oh, well, your schedule's packed. Let me pull out my calendar. And like, it was just this competition of who was the most stressed out. And it always struck me because it was like, don't you, like, you're the adult. Don't you make your own schedule? I digress. This morning, we are exploring this passage of what does Jesus mean when Jesus comes and says, you who are weary, I will give you rest. And this might be the most relevant scripture passage for our world ever. There's a lot of relevant scripture passages, but this might be in a world where we spend $17 billion on energy drinks because we're too tired. In a world where we are billion, yeah, in a world where we are constantly don't talk to me till I've had my coffee because we're too tired. In a world where, where depression and anxiety are skyrocketing, in a world where, where we always talk about how we don't have time for anything, here comes Jesus saying, come to me, you who are weary, and I will give you rest. What is Jesus inviting us weary people into this morning? If you're not weary. If you haven't found yourself overburdened, go ahead, just take a nap now. You're fine. You're probably already napping if you're not overburdened. Um, But for the rest of us, we're going to explore this. What is Jesus inviting us into? And I want to start by just um, telling you what Jesus is not inviting us into. And so this is a little bit of context where this is coming from. Right after this, Jesus is going to get into some trouble because he's going to do some things on the Sabbath he's not supposed to do. And so right off the bat, I need to tell you, Jesus is not talking about the appropriate way to participate in the Sabbath. This isn't Laura Ingalls Wilder where you have to twiddle your thumbs and here's the rules of following the Sabbath. That's not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is talking about true, pure, heartfelt, deep in your bones, rest, renewal, restoration, the thing that keeps you going. And so how could Jesus be inviting us into this life? What is Jesus talking about? Because when I became a Christian, it turns out I'm still just as busy as I was before. What Jesus is doing Um, There's a lot of things. This really could be an entire series. It was a couple years ago before COVID. I preached a series on this. I won't belabor you through all of those sermons. Um, But briefly, some of the things Jesus is doing in here is we need to acknowledge that when we join with Jesus, when we join Jesus' yoke, Jesus is inviting us into a world with different expectations. Jesus' expectations are different than what we are used to. You heard it in our text in Zechariah, our call to worship. Um, At the time, the the important thing was how strong is your military? And God says, I'm going to come and I'm going to break all the militaries. That's not actually what matters. You hear it here where Jesus is saying this has not been revealed to the wise people, to to the leaders, to those that have a theology degree like myself. That's not who got this message, but the infants did because this doesn't make sense. This is countercultural. This is against the narrative everything's telling us. Jesus invites us into a world of different expectations. He says, come take my yoke. I expect things differently of you. What do I mean by that? You see, the world around us has these expectations that tell us things like what you do and what you produce is what your worth is. 
I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a necessary part of our society that your company cares about what you can produce for them, what your output is. And so that is how our worth is gathered. Look at this thing that I made. Look at all of this stuff I was able to do. And so the expectation is you're, if you're not doing enough, if you're not producing enough, then are you really that worth? while. There's other expectations that we have. We scroll Instagram, we scroll Facebook, and we see all these other people's lives and how perfect they are and how pretty they are and how exact their hair matches their shoes, and it's incredible. And we say, I can't be like that. And there's these expectations that we're always perfect and prim, put together, and we know what to say, and we know what to do, and we know what to wear. And Jesus says, I don't care about any of that either. We have all these expectations in our world of what matters, and Jesus comes along and says, no, that's not actually what matters at all. Earlier in Matthew, Jesus says, look at the flowers in the field. They don't care what they're wearing, and they're still beautiful. What are we doing? Jesus sets a tone of different expectations. Jesus comes along and says, take off this heavy yoke of production and giving and doing and take my yoke. My expectations are different. I care about a different thing. The cool thing about Jesus's expectations, Jesus's expectations are love God, love other people. That in itself is not necessarily easy. There's a lot of difficulty in Christianity, but it becomes light because the trick with Jesus's expectations, while the rest of the world asks us, us, what are you doing for us? Jesus's expectations actually replenish us. They actually refill us. They're actually good for us. This reminds me a lot of all the way back in creation. We've talked about this before, the idea that, that when God created the world um, in Genesis 1 and 2, it was so different than other creation stories at the time. Because all these other creation stories, they said, and God created humans so that they could serve the gods. You know, it's here's the they were going to produce food, and they were going to like build us temples, and here's all the things they were going to do for us. God comes along and says, I created humans, and then I rested. God built rest into an integral part of creation because God said it's not about what you can do for me. It's about being in relationship together. So from the very core of creation, we're reminded this is a different place. This is something that is for us and not just for God, these expectations lead to fulfillment inside of us. Study after study has shown that if you care about other people, you yourself feel rejuvenated. You yourself feel energized. You yourself feel happier. If you're thankful, if you're grateful, if you're considerate for others, your life gets better. It doesn't make sense, but it makes sense when we remember God, God set these different expectations and invited us into them, and these expectations don't wear us down, but they actually lift us up. The things God's asking us to do are actually good for us. These different expectations that Jesus invites us into, Jesus calls a yoke. He says, take my yoke upon you. Um, and I need to clarify, because not all of us are farmers in here. I grew up in West Texas. I've seen one of these before. What a yoke is. We're not talking about like the bodybuilding, like get yoked, protein powder. Um, I don't know anything about that version of yoked. Um, but this yoke, you see it on your bulletin. Um, you see there's a picture of cows. Uh, and you all know I just love incorporating pictures of animals, so that's really what that was about. But it's this picture of these, these two cows, and they have this, this wooden thing over their necks. The point of a yoke is, is it, it allows livestock, normally ox, cows, maybe donkeys, maybe horses, um, to like pull a plow, to pull a cart, to do some work in a more efficient way. Um, but the components of a yoke is that you're, you're at least two, normally two. You have these two animals joined together, and it kind of hangs over their neck. Yeah, Brian just threw it up on the screen. Good job, Brian. Um, so you have these two animals, and it's kind of hung over their neck. And so when Jesus is saying, come take my yoke, Jesus is saying, join me in this thing together. It's not just, here's these expectations I expect you to live up to, but it's come watch how I do it also. Jesus invites us into community. Jesus says, here, throw this over your neck, and I'm on the other side showing you the way. Let me lead. The other tricky thing about a yoke is that I don't, I'm not like a yoke expert, so I can't guarantee this, but any yoke I've seen involves more than one animal. 
The other tricky thing about when Jesus says, I'm inviting you, come put on my yoke, is you're never going to be alone. Jesus is not just inviting us into a new set of expectations, but inviting us into a community with which to explore those expectations together. It's why we call the church the body of Christ. So when Jesus says, come throw my yoke on you, he's saying, come join with all of these other people to do it too. The beautiful power of community that allows us to find rest, it um, reminds me of the old-fashioned, or still happens, I think, barn raising in the Amish, Amish community. We need a barn, so we're all going to get together on a Saturday and build it. And it's not going to be that stressful. We're going to actually make a party out of it, and we're going to have a big feast, and everyone's going to get to show off like Jebediah's new hammer and um, Ezekiel's awesome sawing skills, and it's going to be so much fun because we're going to do it together. Jesus is inviting us into this community, and the curiosity is what does it look like to have a modern-day barn raising? We are not Amish. We are not building barns. I'm currently trying to build a greenhouse, um, and y'all don't want to be involved in that project. Uh, we are not doing that. So what does this modern-day communal barn raising, taking our, our burdens and sharing them, look like? It means being in authentic community together where we're open with what help we need and we're open with helping each other. The biggest barrier to this is in today's world, if I did have a barn I needed help with, and it turns out Eric is this great architect who's designed 100 barns, he would say, hey, you need some help? And I would say, no, I'm good. No, I'm fine. I don't need your help. And so I'd be out there with like this 500 pound like log and I'd be trying to lift it. And, you know, Taylor would come by and say, hey, man, I'm literally a firefighter. I can help you lift that. And I'd say, no, I'm good. That's fine. I don't need your help. We need to start being willing to take the yoke of community upon ourselves and accept help when it's offered and be open about the help we actually need. We need to be open to the community around us and what it is able to do with us and for us. Um, it's one of the best gifts that we have when we take upon the yoke of Jesus, and so often we pretend like another ox is not in the neck beside us. And so Jesus comes and he invites us. He says, if you're weary, if you're weary, if you're burdened, come and take this yoke, not this other one. Come and take my yoke. Come, have these lighter expectations. Come, have this community to do things with, and let's go together and change the world and also feel good doing it. Um, the the cool thing about that community aspect, um, this is almost an aside, but the cool thing about that community aspect is it also, it allows us to do things we don't normally get to do. There's a guy, I can't remember his name now, um, he's a theologian, so y'all can Google it, I'm sure you'll find it, but he talks about what Sabbath is. He says, Sabbath isn't just sitting on your hands all day. He says, if you spend your whole time thinking, maybe Sabbath is doing something with your hands and vice versa. If you spend your whole time working with your hands, maybe Sabbath is sitting down and thinking. It's using different parts of our bodies and minds and existence. Church, community, it's this unique space where we get to do that, where Jonathan, the provost, theologian, academic, gets to come to my house and pull tree stumps out of the ground. Um, where It's true. It happened. It was wild. He taught me how to use a come-along. Um, where people who spend all week working get to sit around and talk about what does it mean that God is offering rest. We get to engage the different, these different parts of our lives and find rest through it. We get to explore unusual talents. We get to ring bells even though we're not a professional musician. We get to, to tinker with the things in our lives, try new things, all of this through this beautiful communal yoke. It's an incredible thing that so often we kind of dismiss and shrug our shoulders at and say, oh, I don't actually need that. Jesus is inviting us into this different life. But there is one trick with all of this, this idea of being yoked over the neck, this idea of being yoked and, and connected to this body of Christ. And um, it's kind of a tricky thing about community. And I I need to clarify, I am not a scientist. This is just like the blanket clarification, so I'm going to make eye contact with the scientist now and say I'm sorry in advance for not explaining this correctly. Um, but what this reminds me of, the danger of this, y'all guys know how like heaters work? Um, y'all know how like air works? That's a weird way to say that. Okay, so what I mean, so our air, this room we're in right now, we can't see it, but it's full of all these tiny little air particles, right? And they're all just bouncing around, they're hanging out, they're gas, it's great. Um, we're breathing it. It's going all over the place. The way a heater works is it's cold, 
and there's this flame, and the air passes over it, and it heats it up, and then it pumps it in the room, and then the room gets warm. What's happening is that, is, is that heat is passing energy into these air molecules. And so those, those, those heated up air molecules that have a whole bunch of energy, they come into the room, and then they slam into all these other air molecules and give them some of their energy. And so they're sharing all this energy and they're bouncing all over the place. And so the one that got hot gets a little cooler and the one that was cold gets a little hotter. Um, and then you have to do the cycle all over again and put more energy in the air and cycle it over and over again until all of the air has enough energy for it to be you know, 70 degrees or whatever it's supposed to be. Um, but it's this energy transfer. And so you imagine all these little buddies just bouncing all over each other. It reminds me a lot of times whenever I like walk into a room and everybody's quiet and I'm like, hey, everybody. And they're like, oh gosh, too much energy. Um, but it's that, that bouncing, right? I bring that up, that complicated science analogy. I bring that up because that is true of how we are in life. We walk into a room with these certain energies and then we bounce it all off of each other and pass it on. And that's really great sometimes because sometimes we walk into this room and we have an energy of peace and we have an energy of love and we have an energy of joy um, and we get to spread that to all these people. That's kind of the, the thing about being a Christian. Um, it, with this extended heater metaphor, it's like you're passing through the flame and the flame is Jesus and we're getting the fruits of the Spirit and we're getting re-energized and then we go out in the world and then we spread that all over the place and then we have to come back to get re-energized over and over again and slowly we collectively are changing the temperature of the world around us. That's awesome, except sometimes it goes in reverse too. And here's the dangerous part about this scripture and why we're talking about this, is sometimes the energy we're carrying it is an energy of busyness. And so we show up in the room and we talk about how busy we are and we, we work too much and we don't say no to things and it's 10 p.m. and we're sending emails and the people around us start getting busy too because they can't help it. We pass that energy off. And so when I'm working, I'm making the person I'm, I'm texting work. I'm making them think about work at 10 p.m. and I'm making my family have a different schedule. And now, unfortunately, Lately, when I sit at a table full of teenagers, they don't tell me about it, how excited they are. They tell me about how busy they are because we've passed our busyness to our kids. We've taken this energy of busyness and we've taught our children to be busy. Jesus says the, 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 the children understand this and we're like, hang on, Jesus, let's make sure they don't either. We've taught our kids how to be busy. We, we teach the people around us how to be busy. And so if we're not willing to take the yoke of Jesus seriously, if we're not willing to take these expectations seriously, if we're not willing to lay our burdens down and say, God, you know what? Maybe I don't have to do this because I actually trust you. Shocker, I actually trust God, so I don't have to be the one to do it. If we're not willing to take a break every once in a while, to take a Sabbath, to take a day off, Everyone around us can't either. And we go in this spiral of busyness and tiredness and overwhelmingness. And God's saying, I have the solution. Here's the yoke right here. You're supposed to be the people wearing this and carrying this into the world. And we're like, hang on, God. I'm too busy to swim practice. I'll be back next week. I'm like, we carry that energy. And so that's the problem with this community is this only works if we take it seriously. It could either be really good or really, really bad. And so this morning, I not only invite you for your sake to take this yoke that Jesus offers and to put it over your shoulders, to consider these different expectations, to embrace this communal life for your sake, but for everyone around you. Our world needs this. We need need this, and it starts right here with us. Sitting for an hour, getting a little bit bored, being uncomfortable with silence, um, letting our mind wander and yawn as we sing hymns too slow, or as William talks about things that I don't care about, but letting ourselves rest. It starts here, and then we take it out into the world, and we keep coming back to Jesus and saying, Jesus, I am committing myself to rest. And slowly, we begin to chip away at the systems that feel like they're overwhelming us all. Like I said, it's not necessarily easy. But the load is light. That is what you are invited to this morning. Pray with me. God, we thank you so much that you have offered a yoke that is light. That you have seen the cry of the weary. 
that you have felt the pressure that is on us, and you have said there is a better way. God, we pray that we might accept that better way, that we might be willing to throw that on our shoulders and live a life that is pleasing and acceptable to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.